high. In 2022, the collective West has deeply involved itself in the Russo-Ukrainian conflict. Many pundits are hopping on this gravy train, with no idea what they're talking about. They see Ukrainians as their Mandingo fighter that can leave Russia with a bloody nose. Any cultural context is ignored altogether. And let's be frank here, they barely knew of Ukraine's existence before 2022. In contrast, Russians and Ukrainians know everything there is to know about each other. There are millions of Russian-Ukrainian families. Millions of Russian men sleep with uh, Ukrainian wives at night, and vice versa. Yet our vision is clouded because of this conflict and years of artificial separation from each other. We are two orthodox people coming from the same source. A seed of discord was sown into our lands, and all we reap is bloody harvest. But I get why Ukrainians are mad at Russian, because when Russian patriots talk about Ukraine and its people, you can often hear this line. Ukrainians are just misguided Russians. Their language was made up by Austro-Hungary, or the Soviet colonization, or whatever. Granted, there is a lot of truth to it, from a Russian point of view. But it does sound offensive for the people in question. And it's not fully true. If Ukrainian identity was made up or artificial, then they wouldn't fight and die for it in this conflict. It's very much real now, in any case. We need to accept that this is a real nation that exists. Although it's definitely fractured in many different subgroups. I will try to present you a very simplified version of it. There is the first group. Russians. Russians in Ukraine who recognize themselves as Russians. Uh, there used to be much more of them, naturally. But uh, now this number is fading. They are mostly Orthodox of Moscow Patriarchate, or atheists. The self-aware Russians make up an absolute majority of Crimea, about three quarters of Donbass and around a third of Novorossia at large. It would be around 15 to 20 percent of the current Ukrainian population, but of course it's just a guesstimate. The second group, uh, people with a fluid identity and mixed language, aka the Surzhik zone. Surzhik is a mixed Russo-Ukrainian dialect. A lot of those people are former Russians who underwent uh, soft Ukrainization. Some of them might be Ukrainians who underwent Russification, so it's really hard to pinpoint their true origin. But in any case, these people are the most populous group in the country. They're not the most influential, that's for certain, but uh, you can find uh, them in large quantities in southern Novorossia and central Ukraine. Typically, they're pretty loyal to Ukrainian state, they consume popular Ukrainian culture, and dislike Russian Federation. The, those are the people who switch their language according to geopolitical climate, and a lot of them can be spotted in the ranks of FAU. Third group, historic Ukrainians, or Malorussians, or Little Russians. They mostly live in central Ukraine. Most of them attend Orthodox Church of Ukrainian Patriarchate. They have their own history and culture, which they are extremely proud of. It is closely intertwined with Russian history for millennia. Mala Russia is a center of power in its own right, that was always engaged in a healthy rivalry with Novgorod, Moscow and then Petersburg. Usually they know Ukrainian and Russian quite well. Their place of habitat roughly resembles the borders of Cossack Hetmanate. They are definitely not the descendants of weird Nazi collaborators, but they are Russia's unruly allies and relatives. In better times, we would engage with them not with artillery, but in sick banter. But unfortunately, it's not the case. A good example of a true Malaros would be Nikolai Gogol, 
This is the core and the heart of the state and nation. Then there is a fourth group, the West Ukrainians. This is a group of people that is most, uh, it's not uniform either, but generally it's a group of people that is the most distant from Russians. Three regions of Western Ukraine are Greco-Catholic. Their closest historical predecessor would be the Kingdom of Galicia Valinia. For most of their history, they were a subject of Poland and Austro-Hungary, so they never really lived that long under Russian rule. They make up about 15% of the population, maybe 20. So I would say that Russians in Ukraine and West Ukrainians, aka the antipod of Russians, make up about the same percent of the population. And in between them exists this gray zone of Surzhik and core Malorussian territory. So it's not just east and west like people would pretend it is. I would say it's three or four regions that you can easily detect. So just before the outbreak of the First World War, in February 1914, of the former Russian Minister of Internal Affairs, Pyotr Durnavo, wrote the following about Russian occupation of Galicia. It is clearly disadvantageous to attach Galicia to our homeland just because of the feelings of national sentimentalism. This area has lost all living connection with Russia. After all, for a negligible handful of Russian-spirited Galicians, how many Poles, Jews, Ukrainian units will we get? The so-called Ukrainian or Mazepa movements are not a big problem now, but it should not be allowed to grow. Galicia, being included in our country, can radicalize Malorussians, and under favorable conditions, this rebellion can become an avalanche. Truly prophetic words. Durnovo was right, of course. Sometimes it's better to leave people outside of your civilization, because no matter how large it is or how powerful it seems, it's a fragile thing. After the fall of Russian Empire, Galicia has returned to the Polish rule. It was under it until 1939, when USSR has occupied and attached Galicia to Ukraine once again. From that point on, it became the Mecca for Bandera worship, Nazi collaboration and other weird things that are very un-Russian and for that matter un-Ukrainian as well. They, they don't have much in common with Central Ukrainians, religiously or linguistically, but they certainly are most well-connected and culturally radical region. So after the Ukrainian independence, they quickly rose to power and uh, to this day they hold post-Soviet Ukraine in a firm ideological grasp. Their resentment and the inherent Russophobia became the state ideology of Ukraine and displaced uh, core Malorussian values. It's a very isolated and self-serving ethno-religious group. Important aside here that the Karpatia and parts of Ternopil are not in the West Ukrainian group and are quite different. But it's not that important to our discussion here. But please uh, do press F for Rusini in the chat. So, uh, the point why I am making this little audio that would later become a full-fledged YouTube video with uh, funny pictures. For a couple months now, I was reading an anonymous personal blog written by a girl from Mariupol. She shared her personal experience of uh, surviving Azov occupation, the Russian assault on the city, and almost miraculous escape to Russia via the Green Corridor. She is a typical member of the second group of uh, fluid Ukrainians. She is a political Mariupol Zoomer, born around 2002, linguistically Russian, and I presume ethnically also, but uh, she doesn't recognize it, and she barely if ever mentions her ethnicity or her general identity. Because it's effectively raised, 
She was loyal to the Ukrainian state. Uh, she called uh, AFU and Azov our boys, and DPR and Russian forces occupanti in her diaries. Frankly, I can understand that. If you are born in an uh, already independent ethno-national state of only Ukrainians that banned Russian language, well, when Russians attack, not everyone would uh, welcome it or think that it's a liberation of any sort. It's a very interesting blog. It made me understand uh, this psychology of the Surzhik Ukrainians or the Russian Ukrainians much better. In Mariupol, despite the good climate and beautiful beaches, uh, it always was an industrial city. In 2014, there was a rapid expansion of DPR rebels in Donetsk Oblast, and Mariupol is part of Donetsk Oblast. DPR rebels were some kilometers away from Mariupol, but then, due to shady deals, there was no real assault on Mariupol. And from 2014, this city became a base of operations for a freshly formed Azov Nazi battalion that controlled this city for eight years. Apart from recruiting and killing outspoken pro-Russian activists, it ventured into various business schemes, extortion and protection rackets. It grew more powerful and well-equipped with every year, until March of 2022 happened and Mariupol was encircled. But back to our girl, she just bought herself cute figurines and other aesthetic things to decorate her room. And just her luck, the occupante started shelling the city, windows shattered, sirens blaring. I can empathize, truly. I wouldn't be crazy about special military operation happening in my city either. No one would. So she grabs her stuff, her cat and whole family runs to the basement. It's locked. The neighbor who has the key was hesitant. It was an older lady and she said to them, ah, don't bother. Russians wouldn't touch civilians, they would just kill Azov guys and move on. But uh, a couple hours later, when they were tired of hearing explosions, she changed her mind and uh, all the neighbors went to the basement. The blogger girl was enraged that uh, there were so many pro-Russian scum in the city that sincerely believed that Russia is liberating people. But it generally fits to my categorization before, because uh, Mariupol is part of Donetsk Oblast, so it's majority ethnically Russian. And it's barely even Surzhik. I guess the divide is uh, strictly generational. A few and Azov, they started hiding in apartment buildings and breaking in other people's flats to set up firing positions in there. It also happened to them, the girl in question and her family's flat. One day, her dad went up from the basement to get his documents, but there was no door anymore. All he saw there is a ravaged flat and a couple of soldiers who were eating some tushonka on their sofa with a lot of uh, ammunition and guns. That was the first moment when the Mariupol girl felt angry at their own Zahisniki or defenders in Ukrainian. And she started wishing that DPR would soon get control of their part of the city, at least their neighborhood, because it's the only way to stop the shelling. DPR and Russians were shelling the positions that were held by Ukrainians. So it's uh, absolutely logical for people to want to live in DPR-controlled areas. And she literally wrote that, yes. Uh, I like this blog for the honesty. The Ukrainian military that held uh, this neighborhood started telling them that they shouldn't try to escape, that Russia is not letting anyone through, that they should stay at the basement or go to Azov style with them later on. Luckily, the Mariupol families in the basement had enough food, but water was harder to find. A man went on a dangerous trip to the well. When explosions hit too close, they would uh, boil snow. Yes, she said that it was unusually cold, down to minus 10 Celsius. I wouldn't believe that, but I checked and it's true. 
The entire story is very cinematic because she and her boyfriend were hiding in different shelters, right? He had mobile coverage and she didn't. So he would send her a hundred messages a day to no avail, just checking if she's alive or not. Finally, the basement dwellers have heard about the green corridor for civilians made by Russian army that is close to them. There was a real fear that the Soviet commie bloc would just crumble and bury them underneath. You can only imagine how scary it is. The family took their stuff, she took her cat and they ran by foot. I imagine getting out of the basement was like leaving the vault in fallout, but worse. It's your own city. All the houses are black, they're scorched, the floors are crumbling, sounds of explosions and they ventured into this uh, apocalyptic setting and uh, reached Russian checkpoint. Russians transported uh, refugees on a bus to Nova Azovsk, a small town to the east of Mariupol under DPR control. Then they reached Taganrog in Russia. She and her family did not want to stay in Russia. Last I've seen, more than a million of uh, Ukrainian refugees stayed in Russia. I must admit, there was some panic in March that uh, sanctions would destroy Russia's economy. You couldn't just not hear the word USSR 2.0 being thrown around again and again. Well, we are the most sanctioned country ever. Those fluid Ukrainians didn't like Russia in the first place. They were convinced that Ukraine is better because, well, it has better climate or distant chances in the future to join the EU or whatever. Well, then Russia destroyed their city and then you must go to Russia. But uh, they picked a very exotic path for sure. They went to Moscow, then Peter, there they left via Baltic countries to Poland. After excruciating bureaucracy, they reached a local refugee camp where various organizations were present. International ones like the French, the Germans were there, the, of course the local Poles. There were a lot of news about Polish mafia members uh, taken almost by force Ukrainian women, lone Ukrainian women and then prostituting them. But uh, this family, consisting of this blogger girl, her dad, younger brother and boyfriend, with uh, which they reunited, they got lucky. They were noticed by the French organization there and were invited to live in France. The tone of her blog changed entirely when they reached a medieval commune in Brittany that is populated by wealthy do-gooders. They were allowed to stay in a vacant house, like a spare house of some richy McRiches. And uh, they were firstly surrounded by attention, showered with gifts. She was absolutely ecstatic. The French people are so, so nice, they don't drink alcohol, they don't uh, overeat, or they are religious and always cheerful, even their dogs don't bark or poop. I'm studying French already. It's incredible. These are more or less direct quotes from this period of her blog. After a short while, her excitement seemed to calm down. The parents were assigned to a local croissant factory. I'm not kidding. Some freebies also were expiring for Ukrainian refugees. For example, there was a free pool. Ukrainian refugees were given out a pass. It is expired in a month. And later they were relocated into an abandoned house that belongs to the state, a very decrepit one. But not so bad either. They quickly made a home improvement and uh, yeah, they're very resourceful people and very hardworking. Now they are doing all they can to become perfect citizens in their new home. The memories of the war, judging by her blog, seem to be fading already. They have a conversation with uh, the local Russians. It's as if the fate has given them a new chance at life. They are eager to learn and adapt. That's the impression that I've gathered. In August there were some funny posts by her. A shocking revelation! It turned out that the French 
like to drink, eat and fart as loudly as possible. She was shocked by the last point, but yeah. Now, let's imagine the future of this family if war did not happen. Their apartment would be intact. They would not be displaced. They were passively loyal to their guys. They didn't question why they had swastikas on every visible part of the body or why should Ukraine kill Donbass citizens. It was just irrelevant to this family and most of the families of Ukraine. It's important to repeat that Ukraine has effectively banned Russian language from its official institutes. Sure, you could talk in Russian in private, as most people did, but uh, they were surrounded by forced Ukrainization at schools, uh, jobs, TV. You can't really hold any serious position or even be a cashier and talk Russian anymore. There's nothing bad in Ukrainian language, right? But unfortunately, it comes with an ideological package. I have never seen a Ukrainian speaker having a wide range of possible opinions. Like in Russian, there are so many people, right? There are communists, fascists, uh, Russophobes. A lot of uh, Russian speakers are Russophobes. America booze, there are like India booze. There are people who think they are wolves, bears, uh, lesbians or transracial Mongol throat singers, anime aficionados, whatever. Russia is a language for everyone. Ukrainian speakers seem to have just two possible positions. The Lovi Dovi Hail Europe, uh, we love EU and LGBT, LGBTQ, fuck me, LGBTQ, democracy is beautiful. This is the first position and the other one. The blood of pig dog Muscovitz spilled on this ancestral stone will please Odin. This uh, some pagan Nazi LARP bullshit. Well, there is a third position of uh, like some clueless farmer, right? But uh, yeah, it's not really a position, really. I'm concerned about Russians in the East or fluid surgic Russians in the East of Ukraine being forced to hate their ancestors and adopt hostile identities. I don't really care about Galicians or Valinians hating Russia, it's okay, it's fine. But uh, people whose closest ancestors, like grandpas and grandmas, associated themselves with Russians, with our mutual sacrifice during the Great Patriotic War, for all those people, for millions of people to drop the, this identity to the dumpster, this I will not tolerate or understand. And most importantly, this forced uh, hostile Ukrainian identity led a lot of Ukrainian guys rot in the black soil right now. It's ahistorical and illogical to pick languages, to switch between them, to have this position and the other at the same time, to have a grandpa who fought for Russia in World War II and praise Bandera or something like that. It's ridiculous. It cannot last. It will always bring bloodshed. A little addendum. I just know that if there are any Ukrainians or certain types of Russians who are listening to this, they scoff, facepalm and cringe right about now. Because any reference to the war gets instantly dismissed. Why? Because we were brain fucked. It's uncool to refer to the war that took 30 millions of our lives. It is boomer. It is savok. What is the civilized way of doing it? Well, just call it an abstract tragedy. Wear a civilized uh, British remembrance poppy once a year and condemn it. But you should not fixate on it. No sorry. In the next breath, you should condemn Russians, or yourself in this instance, for their Ribbentrop Pact, for their Oriental brutality with which uh, they fought back against the Germans. You should write rape fanfiction about a horny liberator, whatever. This is the course of action for an average Ukrainian or a certain type of Russian.
this well has been poisoned, let me reiterate, we Russians and Ukrainians, we were taught to hate ourselves. We are lab rats that don't get to have their own opinions. It's Watnik. It's not that Ukrainians are true Bandera fans. There are not that many of them in reality. It's their national meme hero that gets Russians mad, and that's why they adopted it. Well, I'm talking about the Malarosi and the Surzhik Ukrainians, of course. Because they got poisoned by the irony and misanthropy directed at themselves. Gradually, they were made to distance themselves from their actual history and turned into edgy forechanders of the worst kind. The fact is, most of continental Europe was united by Hitler's Germany and they killed 30 millions of Soviet people. No buts, no ifs. Russians, Ukrainians, Tatars, Jews, Udmurs, and many, many more. But in spite of it all, in spite of our genocide, in spite of the Soviet leadership, we have won. And all we got in the end was complete disregard and humiliation. 30 million people, and there are close to zero international museums about it. Maybe the sacrifice of Russians, Ukrainians and others is mentioned on the sidelines of Holocaust museums that are worldwide, but I'm not sure about it. This is our mutual national trauma, and Ukrainians chose to ignore it. To wear a British poppy once a year and ironically call themselves Zhida Bandere. There's no such thing as irony. If you refuse to learn from your own history, then you are bound to repeat it. And the slaughter in 2022 Ukraine is a direct outcome of such actions, of the scoffing and the face palming. In any way, we should, I should admit that Ukrainian project, Ukrainian identity is much older than 8 or 30 years. For all intents and purposes, it began to spread at least a uh, hundred years ago. And the core, the Ukrainian Malorussian core, existed for centuries. The Cossack core, it's all there, right? It's not made out of thin air. But clearly, a lot of people were poisoned by a very dangerous ideology. And some people lost the sense of who they really are in the process. But all of it might be just a historical fluctuation, right? If most Ukrainians are so fluid as to switch languages, religions and identities and positions, they can switch back. And that's uh, the most important part, because when Russia wins the war, the Russian-controlled territories would have to be re-educated. The Minister of Education of Russia recently said uh, that uh, the Kherson, Militopol, uh, Zaporozhye Oblast and others will have a classic Ukrainian in their school curriculum. If Western Ukrainians, if Galicians manage to hijack the Ukrainian identity, then Russians could try to bring it back to the more traditional course. But yeah, let's finish off with uh, this Mariupol saga, shall we? I became very sympathetic to those people. Let's uh, return to the questions. What, what would happen to our Mariupol couple, a young couple, if they stayed in Mariupol and no war would happen? Well, yeah, Ukrainian government tried to erase their mother tongue and culture. The situation was especially dire in Mariupol. It was controlled by a Nazi battalion. So I imagine that their children would become bilingual and in school, uh, they certainly would be pumped with, uh, the, with Russophobia and Banderism. The situation would get worse. They escaped this fate, and now they live in France, which is also good at first uh, assimilation. Just ask the Occitans, Normans or Gascons. Oh wait, you can't. But the French would certainly not kidnap you or torture you in the basement for stating an position. So this is now lies in the realm 
of culture, the battle of cultures. Clearly, Ukraine could not assimilate Russians uh, peacefully. They needed state violence and a threat of war, a threat of Putin to disorient uh, its population. But not the war itself, really. War has forced uh, up to 10 million citizens, Ukrainian citizens to leave their residences, up to 5 million to leave the country. A good portion of them will never come back, right? Especially if war would not end. But they might come back to the new Russian-allied portion of Ukraine, in which there is their ancestral home. And that's another question entirely. So, in short, we were a generation apart from a successful derusification of Novorossiya. Now, millions of people are scattered in Russia and Europe. Many of them are rightfully mad at Russian Federation for disrupting their usual course of life. For all the destruction that war inevitably brings. But there is one thing that they won't have to do ever again. They are out of the matrix of destructive pseudo-Ukrainian identity that is propagated by Ukrainian media. Not fully, of course, you can read their telegram channels or sites, but do you really want to read Ukrainian propaganda when you are in France or Russia? Uh, that's not a pleasurable thing to do, I might tell you. You want to dissociate from politics altogether, you want to enjoy life, touch grass, ride your bike, enjoy scenery, whatever, but not do that. Millions of people are out of the matrix. This is something, right? And besides, uh, when you are in Europe, a lot of Ukrainians, even those who try to speak only Ukrainian back home, switch to Russian, because it's much more convenient. Europeans who know Russian vastly outnumber those who know Ukrainian. Some of them would assimilate, but in the age of internet, it's much harder to do. And the thing is uh, that Russian language is a top second or third language in the world on the internet. It's a very powerful internet language. Much more powerful than Chinese or Arabic. Just look at the stats, like the most popular languages on the internet. So what do we have here? A couple millions of Russian speakers now live in Europe. If we are to combine them with uh, Ukrainians who left Ukraine before the war, and I might tell you, it's a lot. It's up to one million every year. <laughs> I'm not sure how many of the Ukrainians are there even. I will get the stat for a video, right? But there are countless of Russian speakers in Europe now who are out of the matrix, out of this bubble, out of the grasp of a weird cabal of uh, Galicians. What happens next? The war ends. And there is a large chunk of uh, Ukraine that is now under Russian control. The same place where the Russian speakers are from. They might come back to this newly found Novorossiya. They would be taught Russian language and classical Ukrainian history and culture. And it would be ideal. Or they would stay in Europe and would be part of the Russian-speaking diaspora there. And, as you know, every Russian speaker is a potential Russian agent, a sleeper agent. Because what if all the people who know Russian are sleeper agents, even if it's against their will? And all the Russian speakers, what they really are is a giant ring of informants and agents. If we are to take this premise that Consciousness is born out of the language itself, that it predates consciousness. Then, yeah, I already see some examples of that. There are hilarious people uh, who escaped the 2014 war in Donbass, who are scattered around the world. There is a guy from Donetsk who teaches Chinese kids ballet lessons. Ballet, the Russian ballet, it is beautiful. He films such a hilarious content, just walking around Wuhan, shouting Russian profanities at not understanding Chinese smiling faces. I believe that despite of all the terror and hardships, 
it's uh, what it is. Europe will be enriched with uh, Russian agents, Russians of Ukraine will return to their roots, and Malo Russians will also start playing their historical role. The only question remains, what is there to be done with Western Ukrainians? How do we isolate them from the rest of the people? Maybe we will have some new Trump figure who will say something like this. We need to build a big, beautiful wall and make Galicians pay for it. It's gonna be beautiful. Well, I suck at Trump impersonations. But who knew? Who knew? Anyway, it was a very random, spur-of-the-moment type of rant, really. And share your thoughts about this subject, about the different types of Ukrainians, about their future, about all of it.